So my name is Dee Dee Williams. Actually, it's Donna Williams, but I like Dee Dee. And um, I am the deputy director here at the Rhode Island Coalition for the Homeless. Okay, so my name is Pat Campbellon. I'm the director of special events and public relations. And I'm Rachel Sylvia. I'm our web marketing and content manager. Uh, my name is Aaron Regenberg. Uh, I'm currently serving as senior advisor on policy to Mayor Lorza here in Providence. Mm -hmm. um, where I'm working on a number of strategic initiatives, one of which is helping the city pull together uh, the comprehensive housing strategy that we need. Mm -hmm. So the coalition um, is a collection of member agencies. So we don't provide direct services per se. We support our member agencies to do that. And what I mean by that is, is like our member agencies are the shelters, uh, the food pantries, uh, all of those um, agencies that provide social services for our constituents for people who are experiencing homelessness or may experience homelessness or have or formerly have experienced homelessness. So we try and provide technical assistance, capacity building, professional development, all kinds of um, statewide uh, provisions so that they can do their job, so that they can manage what they need to manage. And so we help to um, build their capacity to do that. So, well, Crossroads is the state's largest provider of services to the homeless. Um, we provide services to over 3,500 um, individuals each year, including adults, families. Um, in Rhode Island, there's approximately 4,000 homeless people, so we serve approximately 3,500 of them. So we do provide shelter. I think most people per have a perception that Crossroads is only a shelter, and the reality is that um, that's we're really in the business of housing people, and that is really our focus on securing stable housing for individuals and families. So in, in addition, we do have some shelters. We have a women's shelter that um, accommodates 41 women. We have um, an emergency family shelter for 15 families. We had another emergency shelter in Warwick for 12 to 15 families, and we're actually now um, phased out the shelter portion and converting that to permanent supportive apartments. We also have a domestic violence program, so we have a domestic violence shelter at an undisclosed um, safe location in the area. Um, we have 104 units of permanent supportive housing in North Kingstown, beautiful apartments. Um, we have um, uh, elder housing for the elderly, formerly homeless elders, age 50 plus. We have probably around the whole state, we have um, anywhere from like 25 to 30 freestanding properties. Some we own, some we manage for other organizations, and some we uh, you know, work with landlords continually to try and find affordable housing. Uh, we also operate the state's largest um, shelter for men called Harrington Hall, which is in Cranston. We took that over a few years ago, um, and we're operating that. That has about 108 men, 112 men every night that, um, that stay there. Uh, we also provide education and employment services. We've graduated over 125 uh, CNA certified nursing assistant classes. We have um, a Roads to Success program. We have a resource lab where our clients could come and, you know, help with their resume, um, you know, skills, uh, developing their resume, job skills. And we have a learning center where we have instructors that work one-on-one -on -one with students who are um, either in a GED program or, or need some assistance um, in some, you know, some types of educational um, courses. And I'm probably forgetting what else <laughs> We have three values here at Crossroads. Safety, respect, and effectiveness. So safety is um, important, personal safety as well as you know, safety in the surroundings. So we want to make sure that everybody is safe because they come in here with a lot of fears and a lot of anxieties and, and just feeling safe is, is very, very important, especially in a domestic violence, if having come from a domestic violence situation. And respect, we, you know, we respect everybody and, um, you know, whether it's, you know, internal, you know, our staff, our employees, as well as working with the clients, and, and then we strive to be effective in all we do. So a major cause, um, especially for women, is domestic violence, um, being, you know, uh, victims of domestic violence situation, 
And again, as I said, it could be just a number of uh, reasons why people, you know, people come to us. Um, they just, you know, had a, a bad time in their, in their life and maybe they've burned some bridges and they have no family here. You know, they may have moved here. They have no family to stay with. Um, <clears throat> some folks will couch surf with friends and, and for a while in family, but then sometimes you know, that just doesn't sustain itself. Um, there are actually a lot of college students that are um, homeless and, you know, couch surfing and, and even staying in dorms with other people because they really have nowhere else to go. So, um, and we and we have we find folks from newborn babies to, you know, people that are in their elders. Um, We've had um, police drop people off. <laughs> We've had from getting out of prison. We've had uh, people, you know, being dropped off. That you know, in, in hospital, Johnnies that have been released from hospitals and have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a program now where we have funding, and we uh, it's a Department of Corrections program. So we have folks that are going into the um, prisons now and working with folks before they get released because mm -hmm. what happens is a lot of times they've been in prison now they get released but where do they go what do they do yeah. so they end up back not back at crossroads but at a facility like crossroads mm -hmm. and you know they can very easily get back into the the same cycle without the support so we have folks that are, go in there and work with um, these uh, clients uh, to, that will be able to find housing for when they get out so you know six months to eight months ahead of time so that we can really work with them and, and be able to help provide some continuum of service and, and get them housed and have a place to go as soon as they get out. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. We've had students who were homeless in college and because they don't live here in the state, when, they're, when, when there's a college break they can't afford to go home, so they they live here in their cars or whatever until the semester starts mm -hmm. again. Why? Why? Yeah. That doesn't make any sense to me. And you push them out when the semester's over. Oh, you can't live there, right? The semester's over, so you can't live there. You don't give them anything so that they could possibly have a job. You make it impossible for them to get educated and work at the same time. You make you make it so that they can only go to your school. And, and their parents are probably playing an astronomical amount, right? So, I mean, it's really, I can't tell you how many students I've had. And I started asking them, this is how many I've had that I've started asking them now. Where are you staying? So the semester's about to end. Are you going home? Can you afford to go home? And how are you doing that? Because I found out the hard way that people were living in tents or on the street. You know, or, or doubling up and putting themselves at risk because, you know, they can't afford to go home. <laughs> so I think that we're a lot more than people think we are. And as mm -hmm. I said, this building is just one of, you know, one of the buildings that we're probably the most visible to people in Providence like yourself, um, you know, because we're close to the highway. Mm -hmm. And I think people, you know, see the folks that come in and out and... I think they also have a perception of what a homeless person, you know, is or looks like. And um, the reality is that it, it's not. It could be any one of us. It could be homeless. And some of the folks that you see um, on the streets are chronically homeless folks who have severe mental health um, issues and things like that. And while we try and outreach to them, sometimes they're just not ready to get services. But those people you see represent only a very small portion of the population. Um, probably 80, 80 to 90 percent of all the folks we see were never homeless before and will never be homeless again. All they need is just some type of assistance to get them on their way. And it could be something that can happen to any one of us. It could be the loss of a job. It could be um, the death of a spouse. It could be a, you know, a major medical condition. It could be that you pay your rent, but your landlord foreclosed on the home, and now you have to get out, not because you pay, didn't pay your rent, but because mm -hmm. you have to move. And you might not have enough. You might have enough to pay a monthly rent, mm -hmm. but what about the first month's deposit, security deposit, all mm -hmm. of that? Um, so sometimes people just need a little assistance and to get on their way. 
and we find that once they're home, you know, once most people that are homeless will never be homeless again mm -hmm. with the supports that, that they need. Well, that, mm -hmm. but the core structural reason for homelessness is lack of affordable housing. Um, if you've got a house, you're not homeless. If you've got a place to live, you're, you're not homeless. So that's really, as, as, as we see it, the, the, the driver of um, homelessness. So we're, we're really approaching, or um, a lot of people would say are directly in crisis when it comes to housing. Um, we are in a situation where um, prices, costs are going up. Um, the burden on families is increasing. Um, the sort of definition for being housing cost burden is, is that you're spending more than 30% of your uh, income on housing and a huge proportion, something like 40% of Providence residents are housing cost burden right now. Um, <clears throat> we are not building enough housing. You know, the luxury, high income housing, the market takes care of that, but every other part of the spectrum um, from low income, um, affordable housing, workforce housing, even middle class, mid middle income housing, we're not really building um, enough of. Um, and, you know, a lot of families are facing displacement. Personally, <laughs> I think, you know, one of the problems that I think exists here in Rhode Island is we're such a small state, we should have this issue down pat. We should know how to deal with this issue. Unfortunately, um, we have a problem with building, developing affordable housing units, right? And so we could want to put people into housing and think that that's the best thing for them, but we don't have enough housing stock to do that. Uh, we even have enough programs where folks are getting into programs and they're able to um, get fine case managers and get the services that they need, but then trying to find them a unit um, is not, it's just not happening. And so I think we need more resources in our state. I think the major problem why we don't have more resources in our state is because I think our legislators and our uh, policy makers don't really understand this issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that their understanding of the issue is what everybody sees. Everybody sees the person standing on the corner with a sign that says, help, I'm homeless, and they think, oh, you know, that person is probably uh, addicted to drug substances or probably has a mental health issue and or they're probably conning us, you know. And they don't realize nobody is born saying, I want to stand on the corner in the rain and hold a sign. Something has happened to that person to bring that person to this place. And when that happens, we as a society have an obligation to that person to help them to negotiate these systems systems so that by the end of the day they can go home and and I, when I say home I mean a home that is their home that's not our home necessarily or where we want to place them but it's a home of their liking of their choice and they can go to that home and, and, and feel safe and feel um, welcome and feel okay and then whatever services that they need can be wrapped around them while they're there to make sure that they can sustain that home, right? Mm -hmm. And so as a community, we can then support them while they're in that home and make sure that they um, realize that they are still welcome, they're not invisible, they're a part of who we are. And then Rhode Island will be the state that it's meant to be. But for right now, because people see that that one way, um, we don't have enough housing stock. We don't have enough uh, money coming into the state to provide those um, wraparound services. We don't have enough people that care enough to say we're going to uh, have them in our neighborhood, in our community. We don't have enough uh, people saying we're going to give them a job. We don't have enough people saying that we're going to provide them with these services. Mostly, we have people saying, I don't want that in my neighborhood.
Mm -hmm. I think so one of the one of the demands from the homeless community um, and sort of advocacy community for a while has been a day center like there's 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 no place during the day for homeless people to like be and exist that's like safe mm -hmm. particularly like during weather you know during the winter or whatever um, and that has like sort of a concentration of uh, services and referral um, information and all of that. Um, so that's been a push, and it's and it's and it has not happened for NIMBYism reasons. Like it's been really just we haven't been able to find a location where we that and the location needs to be close to Kennedy Plaza so that like people can get there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's been really hard because like. Places everywhere we, we we try to find that like people are like no we don't want that near us mm -hmm. um, so that's a big challenge that we haven't been able to figure out yet um, but I think would make a big difference mm -hmm. um, as a country we have not been investing enough in affordable housing um, you know we in the 1970s we were building hundreds of thousands of public housing units um, by the 80s, 90s that that had sort of gone down to a trickle, and since I think 1996, we have not built a single public housing unit in this country. Um, funding for for housing subsidies has been going down from the federal government, so that's that's a that's a crisis that's been a long time in the making, and kind of fits with with a lot of the things that are happening in this country with um, increasing inequality and a cutback in the the, the safety net that folks need. Um, at the state level, we're not investing enough. Rhode Island, uh, so our neighbors, Connecticut, Massachusetts, both invest literally an order of magnitude more uh, in dollars per capita to affordable housing than the state of Rhode Island does. So there's not enough resources, and, and the city is trying to step up to the degree that we can to, to, um, to do this work. Rhode Island, we used to have like the best community health, so community mental health system and series of supports in the country. We, the state periodically chipped away at it, cut away at it over the years, sort of shredded that net in a lot of ways. Um, we, we are the only state, again, in, in like our region that doesn't have a dedicated funding stream for affordable housing. Um, that, that's crazy, like there's no line item in the state budget for affordable housing. The city of Providence, the, the city council is moving forward on um, an ordinance that would um, dedicate a funding stream to our affordable housing trust. So we're trying to, again, step up as a city. So um, for me, I would think that Rhode Island being such a small state, that we would have a direct funding stream that would speak only to homelessness. Right, so there would be money that would federally come down that would be just for homelessness. Then there would be money that would come down that would be for affordable housing development. Right, so you could do anytime, anytime someone who is a private developer is developing here in Rhode Island, they would. Ha I don't care what they're developing. If they if they're developing high end condominiums, they would have to take some of their money and invest it in. A community that is less than. So if you wanted to put high-end condominiums over on the east side of Providence, then you'd have to go over to the south side of Providence and invest in something over there, whether it be, um, you know, small townhouses, whatever. I don't care. You, if you're doing that, you do this. Uh, we have many colleges and universities in the state of Rhode Island that get tax-free they get taxes, their taxes are cut, their taxes are free. And those of us who pay taxes in this state, we can't even, we can't even go to those colleges for a reduced cost. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if they're going to be tax free, if they're gonna be exempt from paying taxes, then they, and they're building 
all over our state. They're taking over. If they're doing that, then they should be able to invest in the communities in which they are. So if they are over on the east side or if they're over in Washington Park, like Johnson and Wales, Johnson and Wales is, is taking over downtown and, mm -hmm. and all over um, at Allen's Avenue. If they're going to do all that building that they're doing, then they should be able to invest in the communities and, and give back to those communities. Children who come out of those communities should be able to go to those colleges for free or reduced cost. That's not happening. Why isn't that happening? And why aren't our government, government officials pushing for that? And why aren't they more upset about that? Well, and secure then, places to stay. So the city of Providence is um, exploring a number of different um, issues. We talked about source of income discrimination. Um, one area that we are um, really working on now is figuring out an inclusionary zoning policy um, to say that if you're going to be doing a development in the city of Providence, and particularly if you're going to be doing a development that's using like public incentives, our, our TSA tax stabilization agreement, whatever it is, you need to you need to include affordable housing into that development, into that building. Um, another sort of policy area that the city really needs to be looking at. Um, I just sat down with someone from RISD um, to sort of, uh, I'm sitting down with, with folks from each college and university in the city to have a conversation about what is your institution's plan around student housing. Um, I was a student here in Providence and I lived off campus and, and um, so I've, I've been, been through that. And having a huge population of students living off campus that impacts like the housing market, it creates a lot of upward pressure. If I'm if I'm a landlord and I'm just thinking about my bottom line, I, like I can get a lot more money charging like four or five students to be in one unit each in, in a different room, right? That's like four or five income streams versus having one family in that unit. Um, so a lot of people are doing that, and what you what we what we hear is so families are struggling to like find a place because they're all getting so having conversations with our colleges and universities to say what is your housing plan, um, you know what percentage are on campus versus off off campus, is there um, are there ways we can think about this in partnership strategically to incentivize. Um, denser living, whatever it is that, that can alleviate some of that upward pressure. Mm -hmm. Increase the minimum wage isn't the only way to sort of put more money in working people's pockets, but it's like a really good one. It's a tried and true one. Mm -hmm. um, and there are cities across the country that are that are passing $15 minimum wage. There are states that are... Connecticut just this week passed legislation to move towards a $15 minimum wage. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're behind here in Rhode Island. Um, and again, the same, same thing, the reason... People are homeless is because you don't have a home that you can afford to be in. The reason people are poor is because they don't have money. Mm -hmm. And if they uh, are earning more for the jobs that they're working hard on, they're going to be able to better afford housing. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, if, you, if you're working a minimum wage job, if you're working two minimum wage jobs, There is not a there's not a place you can live in this state, and or in this city where you're not going to be housing burden, where you're not going to be spending over thirty percent of your income on housing. And again, that's like that's sort of the healthy level because we need to buy up, we need to spend money on other things too to survive. Um, so there's state level legislation to ban a source of income discrimination, and so that's at the state level. And here in Providence, the mayor uh, has been um, pushing for and championing. Um, uh, passage of a city level ordinance um, that's been introduced by council councilor Rachel Miller um, to ban the source of income discrimination here at the city level. Um, our hope is that it passes at the state level, that's where it should pass, but if they don't pass it there, we want to at least try to do it here in Providence. Uh, uh, so what a, what a source of income discrimination ban does is say that I as a landlord cannot um, discriminate against you as someone who's applying to, to be a tenant in one of my apartments based on where your income comes from. Um, so that, so people get their income from different places, right? 
they get it from a job, they can get it from social security, uh, from uh, you know veterans benefits, from disability, uh, or from uh, a housing choice voucher through the Section 8 program. Um, and what we have seen here, and you know, there's a lot of research on it across the country, that there's a great deal of discrimination based on source of income in housing. Um, and that can be for wherever that income's coming from. I think the, the greatest uh, the greatest area of discrimination is around Section 8 housing choice vouchers. Um, and so we've got a lot of people, and I've heard so many stories, folks who have a voucher um, and they cannot find a place to use it. Mm -hmm. um, they apply for 20, 30, you know, 40 places and just rejected, rejected, rejected. There are literally, there are landlords who will advertise, you know, it's blatantly on um, Craigslist or wherever, source of income need not apply. Mm -hmm. um, we, do, we don't accept that. So that's bullshit. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it, it's discrimination, same as anything else. Um, I think there's a lot of other classist, racist, other things tied up in that. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we're trying to do is, um, is say you can't do that mm -hmm. um, and make sure that all of the vouchers that we have are actually being used. So it's, it's not going to solve the problem by any means, but mm -hmm. for you know a chunk of our most vulnerable residents, I think it can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Hope would be that this year um, there's a few things that legislatively we need to take a look at and so one of those things is making sure that people are not discriminated against um, you know when when they're when they're applying for housing so that people who have section 8 or have need affordable housing that they could get affordable housing without being discriminated against um, do you see that a lot in the system absolutely um, so I think legislatively raising awareness around those kinds of things and the discrimination and the, um, the lack of affordable housing units and, and the lack of us developing affordable housing units. Um, I think that is a major um, thing. But I also believe that if we can get the attention of HUD, um, that we here in the state of Rhode Island could get more money being poured into our state. I think HUD needs to know that we have we have ways in which we could end this epidemic here. Um, we, we, we've become a housing first state and housing first is put someone in housing first and then wrap the services around them as, as opposed to having someone have to be compliant with treatment and compliant with medication and making sure they jump through these hoops before they get housing. Why should you have to do that? Housing is a basic human right. So you should be able to have housing and then have those services wrap around you so you can be successful. One issue that Mayor Lors is really passionate about is um, right to counsel for folks going through eviction. Mm -hmm. Mayor Lors actually, um, his first job out of law school was in Rhode Island Legal Services in housing court, so he was, he was representing um, folks going through eviction cases. And so he saw firsthand like the difference it makes in that context to have a lawyer. Maybe you could explain what, what the right to counsel is? Um, so the idea is just that if you are being evicted and you're in court, um, that you have, that there's a lawyer to represent, to sort of advise you and represent you because, and there's been a lot of research that shows like the difference that makes um, what happens if, if I'm just like some person uh, who was evicted, I show up, I don't have a lawyer, the landlord shows up, he's got a lawyer. I don't know, like I don't know what I'm, I don't know how to deal with this court system, um, and so chances are I'm just gonna get like tossed out on my ass. And they say like, okay, you have to like tomorrow or whatever to get out, um, versus having a lawyer representing you, um, being able to negotiate some settlement. That, okay, you've got, you know, you have the next month to get your things in order so that you have some time to figure out, can I get like a deposit 
um, money together so that I can like find a next next house so that I'm not getting into the cycle of homelessness. I think the, like these things are political, right? Yeah. I think it's that's an important piece to remember. Like some people being homeless, some people living in big mansions. That's not. I would argue that's like not a result of some of those people are smarter or like better or working hard or whatever like it's a series of ultimately political decisions about where are we putting resources about about which communities are we valuing and investing in and which are we extracting from mm -hmm. um, and that sucks but the good news is that like the the there are political solutions to those things like we can we could change these things we could change how we are prioritizing different values in our budgeting to actually invest in affordable housing to, to support folks um, uh, versus like giving another tax cut to, to like the top 1%. Our society has let them down. And so when somebody is evicted because they could not afford to pay their rent, nobody says, why couldn't you afford to pay your rent? What happened? We ask that question, but not everybody asks that question. So nobody knows that the reason why this person couldn't afford to pay their rent is because their employer decided to grope them and they, you know, said no to their advances and now get fired from a job that was supporting their whole family, right? Or nobody says, Why you don't have why don't you have a house? Because maybe their house caught on fire. Mm -hmm and the Red Cross put them up for two weeks, but what, what happens after the other two weeks, right? Um, or nobody says, oh, so you, you, you bought that house in Warwick, right? So what happened? Um, why, why, why don't you have that house anymore? Nobody says, oh, well, yeah, you're right, that was a, prime, a subprime lender, so yeah, there was going to be a balloon payment later on, and you didn't realize that, like, nobody, nobody knows these things. When, when we come out of our mother's womb, we don't come out with a book that says, this is how you rent your apartment when you get to a certain age, and if these things happen, this is what you're supposed to do. So people become homeless because they have episodes where they can't afford to live. And our rent is so high in the state of Rhode Island that you have to make a certain amount of money just to afford to live in a decent apartment, right? Mm -hmm. And never mind, buy a home. And the jobs that we have do not give us the money to afford that, right? So there's a whole lot of things that I would say are systematic and socially um, problems that cause people to be homeless that people just really don't want to look at. They want to blame the person and not our systems and not our society and not our government um, regulations that have caused people to be homeless. But people are homeless not because they choose to be. They're homeless because the system has failed them. We as a society have failed them. We, and I always tell people who work outside of this field you're going to see my client because everybody comes back it comes back right mm -hmm. so I can be I could work at a grocery store and not know about homelessness but I'm going to see a homeless person in that grocery store whether I see them outside begging or whether I see them on my way into that grocery store, or whether I see them come into the grocery store trying to steal something to eat. I'm going to see a homeless person, right? It's going to affect me in some way. Mm -hmm. So you might as well do the work, right? And, 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 and get the satisfaction that you need to say, at least I'm helping in some way. You gotta help in some way. And a lot of people have so many things in their houses and in their closets that people out on the street don't have. So why can't you take you know, that extra pair of boots or those socks or those clothes that you don't even wear anymore and donate them to um, a shelter or someplace that could you know, pass them on to somebody who might need them? Mm -hmm. If you don't do anything else, you can do that. Mm -hmm. I'll make some cookies. Yeah.
So there are some great organizations um, that I think you've, you've been in contact with. Um, I think one is a as a college student, it's not about sort of reinventing the wheel, so figuring out who's doing the good work and getting involved. Um, two, I do I do think it's important to like um, to be thinking politically about these challenges. There is service work that makes a big difference and is important um, in a day-to-day -day way, helping people. Um, there, you know, the Coalition for the Homeless does its sort of census. There, there's like that on the ground work that makes a difference. And at the same time, I think we need to be thinking structurally about what are, what's causing these, these um, problems and challenges and how do we like get to the root of them. And those, that's gonna mean changing policy, changing who has power to make those decisions, who is in the room sort of um, informing how those decisions get made. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I would I would encourage students to, to be get involved, however they are most passionate about, but but to be thinking about how can I support some of the like organizing that's going on as well. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, I mean this is this kind of is kind of weird. I, I don't know how this fits together, but. Because I do think our schools have a role to play in this, and I do think that student housing is a piece of this, it's like being aware of that and um, being a voice uh, within those conversations with individual schools saying we should, like, our, as an institution, we should be um, owning our role in this and, like, trying to step up and, and play a positive part in, in, in resolving the, the, this crisis. Mm -hmm.